To the box, Benson. Fantastic! To the middle. It's yeah! there! Yes, that is my voice that you could hear screaming right there. Ladies and gentlemen, how you all doing? Welcome back to another video on the channel today. It's time to talk about Burnley. I don't know why I did that, but I have. Burnley, as of right now, according to um, statistics that I just picked out myself, of course, because I am professional. Burnley, as of right now, are 46% likely to win the championship title this season. Alongside that, 66% likely to get in the top two. It's incredible considering where we were a couple of months ago. If you guys kept up with my videos straight after we got relegated that, it was a very unknown time for the club that it really could have gone a lot of different ways. At that time, the perception of Burnley and particularly the fan base was extremely concerned and negative at the time of the questions of where the club could possibly go in terms of the current financial situation of the debt that we were in of £65 million of debt due to how we were bought out, including who our new manager would be. Could we get a decent manager that we had planned if we were to stay up? Would they still want to come? The fact we've gone down. How are we going to bring in this new system that will transition Burnley out of Sean Dash football? How heavy would that impact have to the rest of the squad, but also to the club, to the staff team? How much of an impact would that have of Sean Dash? The impact that he had almost a decade of service that he had to Burnley Football Club, how hard could that hit us alongside the fire sale of potential players? Who would want to go? Would everyone want to go? So many questions was asked only a couple of months ago and the job that Vincent Company, Alan Pace, AOK Capital, the owners of Burnley Football Club, the job that they've done is genuinely out of this world that I think this transition, it literally cannot get any better if you if, if you tried. If you wrote it down on a piece of paper thinking, realistically, what's the best that we could possibly get out of this? This is it. This is like, this is a home run. This is Troy Deeney versus Leicester in the playoff semi-final moment. It's incredible. Not only are we winning games, but the transition from what we used to play, which was, you know, very much heavily reliant on set pieces, as we all kind of know under Sean Dyche, that we really were not trying to outplay teams. We weren't really dominant with the ball. We were just making sure that we'd be efficient with our attack and with our big players and make sure that we use that to our advantage. And nowadays, it's very much more progressive, passing out from the back, goalkeepers acting like a and mid at times, literally just ping it about left and right. We've got countless tricky wingers that could take on a man with flair, with pace, that has uh, you know, an element of unpredictability to them, which is something that Burnley fans have not experienced for a long time. Dwight McNeil is the only real sense of unpredictable kind of flair that we've had for genuinely about a decade. Right now, when you look at the Burnley team, it's a perfect blend of experience with like to Jack Cook and Jay Rodriguez with the youth of Anasa Rory and even the lone players of Nathan Teller and Howard Bellis. 15 senior players left in the summer and we brought in 16 of those that left. Maxwell Corney, Nick Pope, James Tarkovsky, Ben Mee, players that are the foundations of Burnley Football Club for the last half a decade. These, oh, other than Corney, of course. Structurally, to the defence was our core and it cannot be underestimated the impact that, that should have had on the club. And the fact that we have re replaced them so well and kept in at least some of that core, like Jack Cork, like Josh Brownhill, like Charlie Taylor, is so important. And we replaced players well and not only replaced them, but the depth behind them is sensational. Burnley right now in the league, I mean, I was hoping for at least top six. And I look at our team and I look at our second string team as well and the depth that we have, I will say right now, I don't think there's any reason why we can't win the league. There's no reason why. I think the depth that we have, the only spot that I would say is a concern is potentially striker. Maybe the Jack Cork role, but as we've seen, we still can win games without him. So really, I think it's just a Jay Rodriguez role that may be a bit of a you know, concern. Other than that, I'm confident. I'm confident. I think any players that come in, if there's an injury, if there's someone that, wants to get, that, needs, that needs a rest... I'm confident that they could get a job. Of course, as you saw in the intro, I was commentator or co-commentator for the game this weekend, which to this day, I still have no idea um, how I'm in this position because, I mean, I'm, I'm just a fan of the club, uh, which just does a few things on YouTube. And um, the fact that I'm able to work alongside the media team, um, know them on a personal level now, you know, by name basis, which I think is quite personal now. They got me on for Brighton last year and I thought that was like a one time, like, oh, let's just give the, the YouTube ad a go. The fact they brought me back means that hopefully this could lead to even more things in the future. That's kind of like my kind of um, dream almost to like work with the media team at Burnley because, you know, if you do a job that 
you love, then you never work a day in your life. And that's what I would forever love to do. Um, I don't care if it's commentating or presenting of some sorts. I just want to be involved, you know, anytime I can. I clipped up some of my commentary for the game, so I will play that part in now. Pleased to say, alongside me today, Liam Waddington, Aka Visa. Let's uh, have a look at Visa. Hello, lads, your local neighbourhood Burnley fan here. We're back again with another video. What a goal that is! Brighton nil, Burnley two. Kiss my jacket, gentlemen. What a finish! Oh, God. Let's see the replay. Burnley, I think, is one of the most exciting projects in England right now. Hello and welcome. <laughs> Fantastic stuff. Some uh, grill clips there. Visa, welcome to Turf Moor. How are you? I'm doing great, pal. How are you? Yes, good. Really good. And you know the season's going quite well, isn't it? Oh, I think it's um, exceeding all expectations considering the transition that, you know, the, the mammoth challenge that the board and the squad has had since the summer. It's gone absolutely all to plan and long may it continue. The turnaround's been incredible, hasn't it? And to become a passing side almost overnight is sensational. Oh, yes. I mean, it's one of the most talked about transitions in English football right now, yeah. considering that first game away at Huddersfield, how fast it yeah. has all all seemed to come together. And it's still such a young squad and a, a new squad, still yeah. forming relationships. It's only it's you know, so exciting to think what it can still become in a couple of months' time. Yes. I mean, it's moved on since then, but... A transformation like no other, I think. Well, you can look at all the stats you want. You can look at all, all possession stats and passing stats and where they're passing and the distribution at the back. And you can look at all these. But uh, but when you are at the game and you're watching it all unfold, it's all about the energy that you sense, not just on the pitch, but also in the, in the stands. It's, there's a real excitement at a club right now. And that's why any fan that goes to games home and away, once full time is done, you cannot wait to get back to the next one. Sucker punch for the Clarets. Know what Tom Ince, nothing. how good Tom Ince is, that's a fine finish. From absolutely nothing, and in this league it could be as simple as that. Just one kick from the goalkeeper, knock on from the centre forward, and just like that. Very unfortunate. Oh, it's looks beaten. Well. Can he pick out a man? Hooks it back for Brown and into the middle. Might fall for Benson! 1-1! Yes. Yeah. One, one. Manuel Benson! What a finish that is! On his left foot, Burnley a level, Burnley one. Ready one on the volley, Manuel Benson. That's some finish. A really good goal. Burnley one, Ready one. Absolute sensational finish there by Manuel Benson. Now we're doing the world of good. Ball in the box, set it up by the Reading defence. Felt it felt so perfect on the volley there for Benson. Hit it first time on his left foot, and it slides into the bottom right corner of the goal. Nothing the goalkeeper can do about it. Uses Benson. Can he get the better of Raymond here? Fantastic. Skips past him. Fantastic. Running at them now. Into the box, Benson. Fantastic. Into the middle. It's yeah! there! Burnley yeah! have won it to the end! Fantastic yes! at the end! It's Zorori right at the back post. And Burnley deserve that. Zorori with the header. Ready a furious. Fantastic skill from Benson to create it. He hooked the ball to the back post. And there was Zorori. Burnley 2, Reading 1. What a moment, what a run. Manuel Benson has oh. turned this game on its head with a goal and with a marvellous assist. He has no right to drive through like that. With the outside of his stronger foot, oh. outside the boot, he got three man back post. You've got to beg that Credit. someone gets their head onto it, someone gets something. And lo and behold, Anas Zauri. Oh. Gets it. Could be a massive win, couldn't it? Oh, these lads, they absolutely deserve this. They've gone through so many times a season that there's been an unfortunate goal in the last dying minutes of the game. In games that we should have come on with three points, one thing leads to another, and now it's just a kick in the teeth, but this team, they keep bouncing back, and just like Sunderland today, is a real test of character. Coming back from 1-0 down in a, in a fashion that you, you would say is quite unfortunate. Reading were a pain to play against they today. Were, they, were, they were a good side defensively. We had to take risk and the substitution of Manuel Benson on the pitch has completely changed his game and what a performance. Yeah, he has changed the game, hasn't he? He's just run at them late on. They've not had an answer to it. And that's the beauty.
beauty of it when you've got these players that they all have something different to offer from the Johan Gubbensons to the John Ruiz to the Churlinovs to the Twines to the Benson's. They've all got something different and all the players are clapping. Every single player is clapping each time the stadium right now. This feels like a big moment for the season. Last minute winners do a lot for a season, don't Absolutely. they? Absolutely. Particularly if you've come from behind. Every single fan here, we've all gone through. We've, got, we've all gone through a bit of pain this year. It's happened a few times. I'm so happy that it's gone our way for once. Yeah, incredible. Uh, there were times that like. Um, it was really like overwhelming almost that like it, it got so loud that I could barely even think like it was really hard to talk sometimes and like watch a game and then think about what you're saying. I don't know. It sounds really dumb, but like when you're in the moment, it, it kind of hits you thinking, wow, okay, this is actually harder than you think sometimes um, to think about what to say next in a way that kind of makes sense. Um, so it's harder than it looks. Like, I'll give you that. The job though, that Vincent company, of course, would get his plaudits now, which he deserves. And thank God, because people were really um, questioning him when he came in. No one thought that he was proven, which to be fair, he wasn't at the time in terms of English football. I thought he did a decent job at Anderlecht considering the financial situation. People just look at, oh, but they were eighth. And it's like, yeah, but like they were having financial problems, having an insanely young team, like literally playing like 18, 19 years for like almost the entire squad ball, like three or four. And then each season, their best player always gets sold on for the cash because they need the cash. Like Doku, like Lokonga, etc. So... I thought he was doing a decent job over there considering the, the the young, experienced players that he had. And he brought the youth from Belgium, his contacts at Man City, his contacts that he has around the world. Players that have some experience as well, Nathan Taylor, Matson, Howard Bellis, alongside his Belgian talents of Vitinho and Zarori and Benson. It's been a perfect blend. Right now we're enjoying company, hopefully he's here for two, three years. I kind of always know that maybe later down the line, let's say three years time, Let's say that we are hopefully maybe in the Premier League that if we stay up or whatever else that I don't know what his next step would be. People are already saying that he is the next replacement for Pep Guardiola. I think that he has a lot more to prove to be Nats, but he has to do yeah he has to be doing incredible things at Burnley. If he gets Burnley back in Europe, then I gotta hold my hands up and say, I mean, okay, fair enough. You know what I mean? Even though that would absolutely pain me. But I don't believe we'll be playing European football um, anytime soon. Maybe four years. Uh, I said before that us going down could be the best thing to ever happen to Burnley because in reality, we needed a massive rebuild. We had basically the same team for about half a decade and that the club kind of was almost... It was getting a bit repetitive in terms of maybe they needed a new challenge, you know, something new, some new voices, some new styles, some new ideas, because, you know, if you keep on doing the same thing every single year, it does get repetitive, it does feel like you're not really making any progress, and it feels like you're almost like, getting too comfortable of doing the same thing each time, and that's what Burnley to do. If we were somehow, if we stayed up in Premier League, let's say we still brought Vincent Company, I still feel like it would be really tough because he had to like make it work immediately. And the players that he brought in had to work immediately. They were not sort of betting in period that like you could maybe take a risk and you, you can maybe, you know, not be on it immediately because it's so much more uh, cutthroat in the Premier League. This year, let's say we go up, let's say that we do fantastic, play some great football, score a lot of goals, go up after that, any players in world football, seeing what we're doing, seeing the players that we have, seeing Fitz and company, we may have the transfer window of a lifetime and bring in some incredible talent. I mean, we were linked to Seca Fafana from RC Lon last season. That's the kind of player that the ownership would want to bring in. That's that. That's what they're looking at. Mislav Orsic, Shadana Mazagreb, he always scores and he should have brought. He should have come in last year, but for whatever reason, this didn't happen. Maybe because we were like bottom of Premier League at 90 for the time with Sean Dyche, and then this window, Joel Van Cabral from Sporting, from Sporting CP Club de Portugal. He also was probably he was close to coming, but I think he just felt like he just was too good for the championship. But a player like him could have come to us if we were in the Prem. It's so exciting, and I, I, I just, I, every single time, full time whistle goals, it's just straight into the next game. So looking forward to the next game. Even if we're drawing, even if we went, even if we lost games, I'll still be gassed for the next game, because it's the way that we're playing. It's the, the, the tricky flair players, pace. I've not seen this at Burnley for like, I've genuinely think my entire life, it's incredible. I've not seen this for so long. Players with confidence, taking a man, it gets, a players that gets you up on your feet. These aren't things that you would really think would be at Burnley, but 
Burnley is just a football club and the way that we played was the way that Sean Dash thought would make sense and it did work. For a long time, he's still a respected man, of course, still a hero to the Burnley people. And I do feel like, it does feel like almost people think that we're, people think that we're disrespecting them almost for like being so... Um, almost in love with the Vincent Company ball right now, that it's almost been disrespectful to Sean Dyche. And I think it's just two different styles. I think the teams that we have are two very, very different teams, are two very different style of assets. We couldn't play the way we're playing now with the team that we had in the Premier League with Sean Dyche. It just wouldn't work with like Ashley Barnes and Chris Wood and wingers of like Goodmanson, who he is in the system, but you can kind of tell the difference oh, between him and Emmanuel Benson. You can kind of tell that Benson is much more likely to take on a man and Goodmanson is much more of a, a safer player that will do the right things but is a, lot, a bit more predictable. But he has a great delivery onto him. He's, he's very smart with how he uses his body. Very different types of players, two different wingers, but two different types of wingers. And that's the difference between Sean Dash football and Vincent Company football. Give me your thoughts down below the comments. Do you think Burnley will win the league? Do you think that we were meant to win the league? Because some people already say now, oh, well, they spent so much money. And I do want to say one thing as well, that I'm seeing championship fans or just fans that's in the football league already start pointing the finger at Burnley, saying, oh, just parachute payments. Parachute payments FC is an absolute disgrace. And I, I, I hear that and I'm like, hold up. We sold 15 players that were senior players of our team and then freed up God knows how many wages. I think it was like 350 grand a week worth of wages across all those 15 players, right? We brought in about 60 odd million worth of transfer fees. Okay, 60, 60 million pounds worth at least, maybe even like 65, whatever, right? We spent 20 mil of that, 20 million on about 16 players. All of them are all young. I think the oldest was like Josh Cullen, who's like 25. The rest were all 18, 19, 21, 22s. Okay. So the wages won't be that big in comparison to what we spent in Premier League. So I'm looking at thinking, so we're still, in terms of net spend, we're plus 40 million. Like we've spent the money that we made. We spent, I believe, 25 mil of that on our debt repayments, so we're now clear of 25 mil debt, so I think we've got like 30 odd to pay now, and now we pay 20 mil of that to buy players, so it's like, where's the parachute payments here? Like, are we just not allowed to spend the money that we made? Like, I get that teams in championship, it, it's harder to spend money. I, I get it. It's hard to compete, and that's why I feel like it, it's so great, but I, I get it because I know that it does feel like it's harsh, but yes, the, the team that was in the Premier League for seven years that had Premier League money for seven years. Yes, we will have more money than teams that spent decades in championship. And maybe that's a restructure in terms of the finances between the Premier League and championship that we can maybe sort out. When Burnley was in Prem, yes, I would like to see new teams come up you know, each year, not the Fulhams, not the Norwiches, and I get that. And I get why people may not want Burnley to because, oh, they were already there for so long. But I just don't think it's just purely power sheet payments and that's it. Like, we made a lot of money by selling our entire club, basically, we spent the money to replace those players because we had to. I just don't know where it's our fault. I just feel like that's reasonable, like, to replace the players that you stole in the first place. I don't know. I get it from some fans. I get it that like, it may seem really unfair, but I just don't know what you kind of would want us to do, I'll be honest. Like, to not spend the money because it may, like, make you feel better for yourselves. I don't know. Anyway, that's my thoughts on the burning situation. Of course, also on the showcase, the commentary clips as well. Again, I feel like a kid at Christmas. Um, absolute pleasure. Yeah, again, to be on the commentary team. Tell me how you think I did on it as well. Um, yeah, and hopefully, if I come, if I go on again or more times in future, hopefully each, each time I go on, I will um, get better and better over time. Um, and also trying to scream so much. I mean, the first go, I thought I was fine. I thought I was fine. I thought I kept it. You know, I made, made one noise, and then I was like, keep it calm, okay. Um, but when it's a 94th minute winner, I kind of had to go mad. Um, I was in the press room afterwards. I saw that um, Paul Wins was completely. Um, I've never seen a, a manager. So like, it, it was honest. Definitely honest. He went he went off at the at the officials for the penalty shout, and um, company came in afterwards, which I saw, and he basically was like, yeah, it's a penalty. Um, so yeah, at least there's some honesty there. Um, a lot of it. So yeah, probably was a pen. I think it was a pen. So Reading fans, it's very unfortunate. It's very unfortunate for the pen shout. But the way that I see it, I mean, we've had like handballs in the box. I remember at West Brom, it was a clear handball in the box and it wasn't a penalty. Uh, I do feel like 
it does suck when it happens against you, but I do feel like things do balance out that you will get some decisions at some point in the season that also goes your way. So I do think it does balance out across the entire year. You know, penalties that weren't given. I know Bellis was manhandled in the first half. That could have been maybe a penalty if he just fell over, but he didn't because he wants to try to be honest. Um, so yeah, that's just my kind of thoughts a bit about the officiating in, in championship. I do feel like if something does go against you, I do feel like, yeah, across an entire year, it will kind of balance out. Some things will go for you, some things will go against you. And I think that I would rather live in a world like that over than with VAR, where, which I feel like, yes, you may get some right, right decisions. That makes sense. And sometimes it's making decisions that almost um, is just made for the sake of it. You know, like, like real, like fine margins of sides that people don't really care about if that was stayed on, you know, or like handballs, like handball rules that's just not consistent whatsoever that's the most frustrating one for me is that we don't actually know what is really the handball rule sometimes it could be given and next game for the exact same thing could be not given and it's inconsistent and that for me is the main problem with var and uh, how it's perceived so yeah i just thought i'd go to that there uh, thank you for watching and i'll see you guys tomorrow for another video and stay safe